game, the players wanted an equity position in the NFL's revenues, 55% of the gross. They also wanted it paid into a central fund controlled by their union. And they wanted a stronger free agency position. The owners wanted to retain their power. Their proposals for them to control the game. As you can see, we're in a, a position of dealing with people that have no sensitivity whatsoever towards the athlete. Most of the striking players conducted their own workouts, while others broke ranks. Well, I don't think it's going to affect my relationship with uh, my football team with the Steelers. I uh, totally disagree with the approach that our association has opted for. He circumvents every single one of us. A lot of guys like myself don't want to be sitting around. We want to play. The stadiums remained empty. The turnstiles were still. While the players were losing an average of $5,000 a week, the owners collected television rights fees and had insurance coverage. The talks would begin and then break off. Some fans still went to the stadium to party in the parking lot, while others found quieter ways to spend Sundays. Even the gambling casinos felt the effects. Bengals became landscapers. Cowboys became real estate agents. Broncos became disc jockeys, while others even tried out for game shows. And one was even a broadcaster. A federal mediator came in to bring the sides together. First, they prayed together. Then they went to a hotel room to talk. The meetings were very bitter, and no agreement was reached. The mediator finally went home. The strike is now five weeks old. Week seven, the owners offer a money now proposal. Some players reject it. Others don't vote or reveal a vote. The New Orleans Saints accept it. The rank and file is fractured. Everyone agreed the season was in jeopardy. On November 16th, the parties meet again. Both sides made offers and concessions, and on that day, the 57-day-old strike was over. We have uh, indicated to management that we would ask the players to return to work as quickly as possible. And the 1982 season was resumed. The aftermath of those strike days, well, it looked like there was such confusion in the union that there would never be another strike. It was a disaster for Ed Garvey, who resigned his position. The players did not get 55% of the gross or a voice in running the NFL. They did get wage, severance, and bonus scales. However, it's important to note that the free agency question, an original goal in 1982, was lost in the long negotiations. So the stage was set for 1987 in 1982. Now, I've always maintained that the reason that you play this game of professional football is for the money. And the biggest and most important difference for the players is that in the last strike, they lost an average of $5,000 a week. If it happens this time, they'll lose an average of $15,000 a week. And another difference, the last time when they finally did come back, they received bonus payments ranging from around $10,000 for rookies up to $60,000 for veterans. Management flatly says that won't happen this time, and that might make a strike even harder to swallow for the players. I think so. That's why that $15,000 a week, that's a big consideration. I don't know if it's worth it. A couple more points. While the owners did collect substantial television revenues back in 82 during the last strike, they also had to rebate a substantial amount of money to the networks because of the missed games. And also, interestingly, largely because of the presence of the USFL and the competitive bidding there, the players now make better than 55% of the gross revenues of the NFL. They didn't get it at the bargaining table, but in fact, they now have it in terms of their salaries. A few moments ago, we talked with the executive director of the NFL Management Council, Jack Donlan, and we asked him why, with the strike date so close, the parties aren't meeting round the clock. Well, I met with uh, Gene on Friday when I, I went down there to Washington uh, to tell him, uh, that, you know, Gene, we'd given you a proposal, which was a, uh, not a take it or leave it type of proposal, but one that was supposed to generate some negotiations. And ha having failed to do that, I wanted to go down and make sure Gene understood that we had a lot of uh, uh, other types of moves. And I wanted to point them out to him and tell him we'd go to the 49-man roster and, and the pension and the severance and the minimums and things such as that. Uh, and I want to make that very, very clear to Gene. Uh, you know, Gene told me, made it very clear that he needed free agency, that the players were going to move, move, and that he'd be back in touch. 
So you're saying as soon as he gets back in touch, you'll jump into that room and stay 24 hours? Oh, I think we should have been doing this a long time ago. I mean, there's no question in my mind about that. I mean, you know, what we have here is we have two, basically two different agendas. We have every poll we've ever read said the players aren't that interested in free agency. The union says free agency is the issue. And then, and, and they keep a lot of other issues around and on the table, I think, to clutter up the, uh, up the, up the mess. I now, really do. The management council has said that free agency is the sole stumbling block. Does that mean that you've moved relatively close to the union's requests or demands on guaranteed contract? on pension, on other key issues? Oh, no, <clears throat> no, no, not at all. Uh, just seven days, seven days before the expiration of this contract, the, the union gave us for the first time their economic proposals. Those proposals were over $200 million. They gave us a proposal for the first time which would double our pension, triple our severance. So when you get a proposal like that, you know that they don't really mean business. See? That's why I went back down there. But I told Gene, I said, you know, Gene, if we got down to some hard bargaining in six to eight weeks, we could get this done except for the free agency issue. Why does football need a free agency system or non-system so much more restrictive than baseball and basketball? Well, I think uh, we, all you have to do is take a look at what happened in baseball. Look at the baseball owners today. Look, what, look what's happened. So all we're saying is our system, every, every, base, every system, every sports system, does in fact have some orderly way to allocate our talent. We've done well with it. Some of the players say there'll never be a settlement until Donlin is out of there, replaced by somebody from ownership who's authorized to truly bargain. I told Gene, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of that, you know, I heard that in 1981 and 82, and when I was down talking to Gene, and as you know, Gene and I get along fairly well on a personal basis, I said, Gene, if it's the messenger and not the messenger, I'll step out. Now, I've been doing this for 25, 26 years. I mean, and if, if I've become a source of irritation uh, to the players, I'd be happy to step aside and let someone else do it. Gene said as recently as Friday, Jack, it's not the messenger. Everybody agrees a strike is inevitable. You want to speculate as to how long it might last? No, uh, you know, I'm still working on the theory that, uh, you know, something might, we might be able to pull a rabbit out of the hat. I don't think it's very likely, but I, I got I to at least think like that. We should note that Gene Upshaw has turned down repeated invitations over the last several weeks to be with us. He cites the technician strike here at NBC, and he is honoring that union, so he is not available to us. Now we turn to Paul McGuire, who is one of the few living humans who thinks there will not be a strike on Tuesday. I think it, sh it will be delayed, Bobby. Listen, the players are 0-4 in strikes. They don't want to be 0-5. If the players don't want to strike, the owners don't want to strike. So get the two guys out of there, Donlin and Upshaw, that are talking strike. Let's start talking positive. Let's let the players and the owners work it out. How are you going to get somebody else in there between now and Tuesday in time? Well, if you get Pete Roselle in with five of the players' wives, I think they can sell it in about 15 minutes. Let's take the serious part of that. The <laughs> players will not accept Pete Roselle in there as a mediator. They want him identified clearly as a representative of management, which in fact is what he is. Then let's get an owner in there, one of the owners that represents all the other owners, and do it. All right, Paul, thanks very much. When we come back, we'll talk with one of those players who might be a so-called scab, a guy who's been paid $1,000 to stand by and be ready to play in the event of a strike. Stay with us. Thank you so much for caring, caring. Ladies and gentlemen, Emmy Award winner, Joanne Woodward. <laughs> They say the car you drive says a lot about you, but we think the kind of people who drive our cars says a lot about Audi. When you're ready to follow your own road, you're ready for an Audi. Look, they're my parents, and I tell you, they're acting different. I mean, they go dancing. Herbert and Jane dancing. I know, Mother thinks it's fun. She wears eye makeup now. I don't know what's gotten into them. Hmm, who says this? Mm. Why not they act their age? To help them get more out of life, people are eating better. Some have found Kellogg's Product 19, 100% of 12 vitamins and minerals. Feel good about yourself. Tennis? They don't play tennis. Feel like 19 again. <laughs> I want my Serta. I want my Serta. Here's why people want their Serta. Why they're spoiled for any other mattress. Only Serta goes beyond just being firm. Beyond what others do. We top our support with the extra comfortable Serta surface. A unique difference you can feel in a Serta Perfect Sleeper. Marvin, I want my Serta. Stanley, we open doors all across America. Doors that open wide and welcome you.
Stanley Doors for the quality of your life. Stanley, Stanley helps you do things right. NFL Live is brought to you by Taco Bell. Just say hello to fresh, exciting taste. Just say hello, Taco Bell. By Audi. When you're ready to follow your own road, you're ready for an Audi. And by Kellogg's Product 19. Welcome back to NFL Live. If the seemingly inevitable strike comes to pass, there will be no football next Sunday, but the following week, the owners vow they will play games with what they will likely call substitute performers and the union will call scab players. This is Walter Briggs, a Division III All-America quarterback at Montclair State a year ago. This year in training camp, he lasted until the third cut with the New York Jets. He is one of those who has been paid $1,000 and is standing by, ready to play in the event of a strike. Walter, you're going to be called a scab. Uh, <laughs> call me anything, Bob. Call me whatever you want. Sticks and stones will break my bones and names will never hurt me is what I used to be told. But. I want to play football, and if, if this is one heck of a way to get into the NFL uh, after being waived or waiting until next year to go into camp again. But if this is how one way I can show what I can do besides um, going back into camp next year early, then that's what I'm going to do. Do you see this is pretty much your only reasonable chance to play in the NFL? No, not really, because um, the, I think if, with the Jet situation that I got into this year with um, Pat and Kenny there. Um, and Coach Walton was only going to keep two. Um, I think if I had went somewhere else, maybe I'd have lasted a lot longer or still have been there. So I don't think that this would be my just only hope. If you last beyond a strike, are you afraid of physical reprisals by veteran players who'd hold a grudge against the so-called scabs? Well, I guess um, for the for the free agent first-year players, the um, the union strike going on. So we we're, we're, I don't think we're too familiar with the union. So. I, I don't think they're going to look at it that way, but um, but if we played for a scab team, so I guess if they want to do that and they want to get physical or whatever, then I guess that's something I have to put up with. If you'd been a little luckier, you might have made a team and been a member of the union. Right. Therefore, do you have mixed feelings? Are you in sympathy to some extent with the union situation? In a certain in a certain way, yeah, I mean, I am sympathetic, but um, I've never been involved in a strike before, so. Um, I am a little biased on both ways because I guess if I was in the union like right now, um, I would feel that there would be a lot of things that I wouldn't do, like probably play. But this is the situation that I am in. I was always told take day by day, and this is one way I think I'm going to have to do it. Have they told you, will you be the Jets' starting quarterback in a couple of weeks if there's a strike? I really don't know with um, our two quarterbacks who were in camp with me, um, Dave Nari and um, Bill Ransdell, the only two that were were in camp with me when I left, uh, or both are injured reserve. So I was the only one, um, I am the only one, I guess, that is capable of starting. So I really don't know, but that's entirely up to Coach Walton, I guess, when I get there. All right, Walter, thanks very much. There's another side to this story. There are some veteran players who at least previously had indicated that in the event of a strike, they'd cross picket lines and play. Now, some may have backed off that original stance, but earlier, the likes of Freeman McNeil of the Jets and Joe Montana of the 49ers had said that they didn't want to strike. Our John Matuzak out in Los Angeles asked two of his former Raider teammates, linebacker Rod Martin and defensive lineman Howie Long, how they felt about veteran players who wouldn't honor the union stance. I'm at the Raider training camp with the great outside linebacker Rod Martin. Rod, would you uh, hesitate at all to punish someone like a Montana or McNeil with a little uh, extra shot? Well, you know, we really don't want to hurt an individual, but it sticks in the back of your mind, too, is when the guys like that uh, go against the organization, go against your cause and things, you're going to do a little something extra out there, to, you know, to let them know that uh, you didn't particularly like the way they stood up for the, uh, with, with the union and the rest of the guys in the league. It's a lot of money. You know, every individual has to make his own decision. It's, it's a tough one. You know, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Trust me out there, folks. It's a lot of money. <laughs> We trust you, Howie. Standing by at our Burbank studios is John Matuzak. Tuz, how emotional do you think this situation has become now? It's become a very emotional decision. Uh, the fact that they're going to strike really affects a lot of players. A lot of people have their, uh, their lives planned out for this, uh, <clears throat> for this football season. They've got their house payments to make, their car payments to take the kids to school. That's what I'm worried about here, Bob, is, is the man in between. The player, I've talked to guys from the Rams, the 49ers, the Raiders. These guys really don't want to strike. They can't afford to. 
but they, they need to make a statement to the owners. Uh, the free agency thing is really almost emotionally ludicrous because it's something that they won't get. Uh, they have to load up on asking for their pension benefits because they're going to need those things. They're going to need insurance for 20, 30 years after they're done. Believe me, they're going to need it medically. What I'm worried about is the Donlins and the Upshaws, the people with political aspirations, getting caught up in their emotions and forgetting about the man who this thing is all about, which is the players and the fans. If they forget about those people, we're in trouble. And I don't like seeing that. It's like Iran, Iraq. Only the peasants are going to lose, and I don't like that. Although, thankfully, not nearly as serious. How united do you think the rank and file is behind the union leadership right now? If you could poll the players rather than their leadership at this point, how united would they be behind the idea of a strike? Well, I'm in a position right now where I should really be careful what I say about that because I know the guys would really like to stick together, but the problem is the biological clock. The owners want us, want us, by us, I mean the players, to really bargain against ourselves. And if we do that, we're going to be in trouble. And with our biological clock ticking away, every day counts. And the owners know this is going to happen. The owners can sit out and wait. They have a predetermined time. Do you think there's going to be a point during a lengthy strike at which players break ranks and begin to filter back? I hope not, but I'm sure you're going to see some of that, especially like uh, you pointed out, Montana and uh, Freeman McNeil. These are guys at the end of their career, and they have to make whatever they can while they can do it. They're really not concerned with the future that much because their future is the immediate future, and that's what they want to take care of, and you can't blame them too much for that, really. Toos, thanks very much. John Matuzak from our studios in Burbank. When we come back after this break, it'll be act two for Jimmy Cephalo and Bob Trumpy. A week ago, they had a sharp disagreement on the air about the possibility of a strike. We'll give them another shot at it in just a minute. What tune? The best motion picture of the year. The film you must experience. The picture you'll never forget. See Platoon on video soon. Lafitte, Louisiana, and old Milwaukee both mean something great to these guys. Lafitte means flat bottom boat racing. And a Cajun feast that'll set your mouth on fire. And old Milwaukee means a great beer. Cold, crisp, old Milwaukee beer. And smooth, golden, old Milwaukee life. There's nothing like the flavor of a special place. An old Milwaukee beer. Old Milwaukee and old Milwaukee life. It doesn't get any better than this. Time to go, boys. You've been in there long enough. Hey, we're not even tired. I feel good. Oh, I've checked the mileage, Andy. Hey, where are the auto lights? We're guaranteed. Guaranteed? I feel good. Yeah, two years, no matter how far we go. But no spark plug guarantees that. We do. So good. Yeah, we're the auto lights. I... So go pull the plug on somebody else. Okay. I feel good. Tried it. Now I believe it. Denerex Tingles tells me it's doing more. Head and shoulders, no tingle. Both have dandruff medicine, but Denerex adds both an extra anti-itch medicine and conditioner, too. Goodbye, head and shoulders. Hello, Denerex. Back now by popular demand, those noted sparring partners, Jimmy Cephalo and Bob Trumpy. Jimmy, we'll start with you, and I heard you say a moment ago, you got a plan in mind that might save face for both sides. Oh, somebody's got to solve this thing. How about this? We take a player who's been in the league for eight years. Say he's in uh, San Diego, but he's got uh, a reason that he wants to go to St. Louis. He's got an ailing family there. It's his hometown. He's got business connections. Let's call it his golden time. Allow him to go to St. Louis without compensation, but an increase in salary of only 20%. This way, the the player has the right to choose the area of the country in which he wishes to live, a right most Americans can enjoy, and it takes away the economic burden from the ownership. All right, Trump, how do you respond to that? Well, Bob, I think this is the reason that we have the strike and that Jimmy Cephalo is still preaching the theory that the National Football League Players Association is espousing the need for free agency. I think if you talk to the vast majority of the players in the NFL right now, free agency is a moot point. It's gone. It was negotiated away back to the owners back in the 70s. They're not going to get it back. We're in the same situation, Robert, right now. We were just before the strike in 1982. The money's on the table. The players had $1.6 billion offered to them by ownership before the strike. 
They went out for 57 days, came back, and got $1.6 billion. This is a money issue at this point, and I think it can be hammered out. Trump, when did you become a friend of Paul Brown? The problem is we've got 28 owners that are Republicans voting for socialism. We've got to give a player the right to be able to choose an area of the country in which he wishes to live and work at some juncture during the line. Why shouldn't he have the same right as other basic Americans? Explain uh, Jimmy, it Jimmy, look, if you want to restructure America, run for office. If you want National Football League players with free agency, you should have voted to turn down the offer that Ed Garvey made the owners back in 77. Not right. only, not only did he give them back the draft, not only did he give him back free agency, he also promised to never sue the NFL again. Now, that I, I call that the terrible triad. Bob, you're the, going the, back to the Alexander the Sentiment back in 1974, no and that was a time when there was no collective bargaining agreement for three years on the table. At the time, the Alexander Settlement was trumpeted as a real way that labor and management could work together in this country. Time 77, out. Bob, I still wasn't in, in professional football. Bob. Jimmy, Time you're out. All that, all that, Trump. Let the ref jump in here, Trump. What about this? They're going to play with these scab teams, and I'm thinking part of management's strategy here is that if I'm on a potential playoff team, we have no idea how good the scab backups are going to be. Now I'm a member of the Chicago Bears. In comes my substitute team. They lose three straight games. We know we're coming back at some point, and I'm blowing my chance to go to the playoffs. It's more pressure on me to accept the settlement. By my opinion of those free agent games or scab games as they're being called is it's the stupidest mistake owners have made in a long time because all it does is give credence to the fact that the players need a union. The Bobby. worst thing that could happen to the NFL is if the National Football League Players Association goes away. They've been their own worst enemy. Jimmy, Trump, last comment. Trump, you're starting to sound like Joe Biden. I said that last week. The scab games are a ridiculous idea. They should never be played. On that point, we agree, Jimmy, and that's it. Indeed it is, and so much for that genteel exchange. When we come back, we'll have a final word and wrap things up for this edition of NFL Live. Please stay with us. I'm 80 years old. And I love Kellogg's Frosted Flakes. Brave adults are coming forward to challenge the notion that Frosted Flakes is just a kid's cereal. I eat them, I love them, and I don't care who knows. With that extra crunch in milk, that frosting just right, they have a taste adults can love every bit as much as kids. Go ahead, Shirley, you can do it. I love them, thank you. <laughs> what more can you say? Frosted Flakes have the taste adults have grown to love. They're great! They say the car you drive says a lot about you, but we think the kind of people who drive our cars says a lot about Audi. When you're ready to follow your own road, you're ready for an Audi. The way I look at it, I've kept my mouth shut long enough. One bite of steak and you won't open your mouth for ordinary fast food again. New steak fajitas. Real steak, real fast. Oh, and another thing. Taco Bell, the only real choice. Hello, Taco Bell. That's $29.95. You can get this. Ah. Just go to Midas. Yeah. And ask for the new Midasizer muffler. Uh-huh. For $29.95, it's guaranteed for as long as you own your car. Wow. The Midasizer from Midas. $29.95. A small price to pay for peace and... The new Midasizer, $29.95. Yeah. Coming up at halftime, Frank DeFord of Sports Illustrated gives his views on the key issues separating the two sides as a strike looms, and we'll also talk with Stan White, the former Lion and Colt linebacker who served as a union official during the last strike in 1982. But before we go, we got to get Paul McGuire's picks. After all, he was 4-0 and against the spread last week. All right. Have at First it. of all, the Giants are over Dallas. Give the 12. Denver over Green Bay. Give the 10. Chicago Bears over Tampa, give the 14, and Monday night, make a mortgage payment. Take New England over the Jets, minus two. Thank you, Paul, and thanks to all of you for being with us. We'll be back at halftime with Frank DeFord, Stan White, and, of course, all the scores and highlights. So long, everybody. Thursday, the season premiere of the biggest cheers in years. Who are these people? The Bars